In September of 2022, the people of Iran rose up in protest against their tyrannical government after a 22-year-old woman, Masa Amini, was beaten to death by Iran's morality police. The reason why she was murdered was that she was not properly wearing her hijab per the standards of the theocratic Iranian government. Shock quickly turned to fury across the nation as the people of Iran began mass protests against this atrocity. Since the protests began, the Iranian government has only doubled down, executing protesters and shooting innocent Iranians in the streets. These protests, which are very much still ongoing, have left many wondering how a government can be so brutal. The answer is long and tragic. During the 1800s and early 1900s, Britain and Russia competed for influence across West Asia in a geopolitical struggle known as the Great Game. Every nation in the region was a potential new ally, or colony, to these larger powers. This included the nation of Iran. In 1901, British oil prospectors, led by William Knox D'Arcy, arrived in Iran in search of new sources of oil, as recent studies had shown Iran had the potential to be a major source of oil and other fossil fuels. The Shah of Iran, Mozaffar ad-Din Shah Qajar of the Qajar dynasty, was open to the acquisition of oil drilling rights by the British, especially after D'Arcy offered him thousands of British pounds. And so, on May 28, 1901, the Shah of Iran and the British signed the now infamous 18-point concession, which granted the British exclusive rights to drill for, refine, and export Iranian oil for 60 years. The Shah himself received a generous financial stake in the deal, including Iran receiving 16% of the yearly profits. Following the 18-point concession, the British began to drill for oil in Iran. After some initial difficulties, the British discovered oil, and soon they were exporting tons of oil yearly from Iran. The original drilling operation had to be expanded, and was renamed the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, later named the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, or AIOC for short. While relations between the AIOC and the Iranian government were amicable at first, this working relationship began to deteriorate quickly, due to the egregious amount of subterfuge employed by the British to keep as much of the oil revenue for themselves as possible. A main point of contention was that, while Iran was supposed to receive 16% of yearly oil profits from the AIOC, the AIOC deliberately hid their true profits from the Iranians, sold to British clients at reduced prices, and established subsidiary companies to divide the company profits into smaller companies not bound by the 18-point concession, and thus not required to contribute to Iran's 16% of the yearly profits. As many Iranian people languished in extreme poverty, revenue that was rightfully Iran's as per the treaty was being stolen by the British. After the end of World War II, Iranian society experienced a surge of nationalist and anti-foreign sentiment. This created a lot of tension between the British and the Iranians within the country which was only worsened by a series of troubling revelations, including the AIOC refusing an audit by Iran to make sure they were paying their fair share to the country, increasing awareness of Saudi Arabia's and Venezuela's fair oil agreements, and the revelation of the poor working conditions suffered by Iranian workers under the AIOC. In 1949, Iranian politician Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh, an ardent nationalist and pro-democracy activist, formed a political party called the National Front. The National Front's main goals were expelling foreign interference from Iran, the secularization of Iranian society, nationalizing Iran's oil reserves, and establishing and expanding democratic and constitutional governance throughout Iran. The National Front believed that nationalizing Iran's oil industry was the only path to a better life for the people of Iran, and many across the country agreed with them. The National Front quickly made a name for itself, and by the early 1950s, they were one of the most popular political parties in Iran. During oil negotiations with the British, on March 5, 1951, Iran's pro-British Prime Minister, Haji Ali Razmara, was assassinated by an Islamic fundamentalist. In the days following Razmara's death, Iran's parliament voted to nationalize the Iranian oil industry. Their rationale was that because the original oil concession was approved by the Qajar dynasty, which no longer ruled Iran, it was void. In the chaos and nationalistic fervor that engulfed Iran following Razmara's assassination, 
the National Front became the leader of a coalition government formed in Parliament. Following a vote by the Parliament against the pro-Western Shah's wishes, Mohammad Mossadegh was nominated to be the next Prime Minister of Iran because of his unceasing advocacy for reasserting Iran's sovereignty over their energy reserves. Although the Shah did not want Mossadegh to be Prime Minister, because Mossadegh and the ideals he represented were supported by a supermajority of Iranians, the Shah was left with little choice. And on April 28, 1951, the Shah appointed Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh as Iran's next Prime Minister. After Mossadegh was appointed as Prime Minister, he carried out Parliament's will, with his closest ally, Minister of the Interior Hossein Fatimi, overseeing the process. Mossadegh set out to nationalize Iran's oil industry and end the AIOC's control over the Iranian oil industry. It seemed now that Mossadegh would be able to realize his dream of using Iran's oil revenue to lift his people out of poverty and modernize the nation under the banner of secularism and democracy. However, this did not happen. Instead, the nationalization of the Iranian oil industry sparked what is today known as the Abadan Crisis which set Britain and Iran on a collision course. The British government was furious with Mossadegh, and Prime Minister Clement Attlee imposed a military blockade of Iran's coastline, as well as heavy sanctions on the nation. Likewise, Iran expelled the AIOC's British employees and began working to export the oil themselves using non-British oil technicians, only to find out that most Western countries, except Italy, would not work with them. After British accusations of so-called Iranian thievery graced newspapers across the Western world. With most countries unwilling to work with Iran, they were unable to sell their oil, and the economy crashed. Mossadegh attempted to make a new deal with Britain using Venezuela's oil treaties as a blueprint, but his overtures were refused. Britain then took their case before the International Court of Justice, only to have it immediately thrown out. Britain remained resolute in its opposition to Iran and expanded its ventures in other West Asian nations to compensate for their lost oil. Furthermore, Britain began attempting to interfere in Iran's politics, including vote rigging and bribery amongst members of the military and parliament, which led to Iran expelling the staff of the British embassy and severing diplomatic relations with Britain. However, the British government still mainly focused on economic penalties for Iran until 1951 when Clement Attlee's Labour Party lost the general election to Winston Churchill's Conservative Party, and Churchill became Britain's Prime Minister once more. Churchill immediately switched tactics, opting for a faster and more aggressive solution to the Abaddon crisis, and under his leadership, Britain began to plot a coup d'etat to remove Mossadegh from power and reclaim their oil reserves. Churchill began seeking American support for a coup to overthrow Mossadegh's democratically elected government, Interestingly, the United States was initially opposed to regime change in Iran due to concerns about destabilizing the country and even sought to find a compromise between Iran and Britain. However, after the British convinced the U.S. government that a Mossadegh victory would be a victory for communism, the CIA and MI6 began working together to overthrow Mossadegh's government in a coup d'etat. While the CIA and MI6 were instrumental in the tragedy that followed, they were not the only actors. Another opponent of Mossadegh was the Shah of Iran, who'd only appointed Mossadegh because he had overwhelming public support. The Shah despised Mossadegh's pro-democracy ideals and how much power he wielded. While Mossadegh thought the Shah of Iran should only be a figurehead, a thought which horrified the Shah. Iran's Islamic fundamentalists, led by Ayatollah Abul Qasem Kashani, also hated Mossadegh. Although the fundamentalists initially supported Mossadegh and the National Front because of their strong nationalism, their alliance ended. Once the fundamentalists realized that Prime Minister Mossadegh had no plans to make Iran an Islamic theocracy, and his secular politics soon turned many fundamentalists against him and cost him a lot of support amongst devout Iranians. This loss of support further made Mossadegh many enemies amongst the fundamentalists of Iran, and many switched their support to the Shah. The last factor that cost Mossadegh's support was Iran's economic situation. As Britain had blockaded Iran and encouraged a boycott of Iranian oil, Iran had no markets to sell oil to. Many Iranians lost their jobs and became impoverished as the Iranian economy entered a severe depression. 
Many pinned their blame on Mossadegh, and as the working class turned against him, Mossadegh lost another key pillar of support amongst the Iranian people. As Mossadegh's government lost support, the man himself remained steadfast, relying on emergency powers to rule as the Abadan crisis continued. As the economic crisis worsened, members of the National Front resigned, and in 1953, Mossadegh held a referendum on whether the Prime Minister should dissolve Parliament and be able to make laws himself. The referendum passed and the Shah was stripped of his powers, with Mossadegh now having to rely on dictatorial powers to continue his quest for Iranian sovereignty. After the Shah was stripped of his powers, he joined forces with the CIA and MI6 in their plot to overthrow Mossadegh's government. With the Shah's backing, in August 1953, the CIA and MI6 launched a coup to overthrow Mossadegh's government, which began with the Shah issuing a decree for Mossadegh to be dismissed from the office of the Prime Minister. The Shah announced that General Fazlola Zahedi would replace Dr. Mossadegh. When the Shah's decree was delivered to Prime Minister Mossadegh, he refused the Shah's orders and had the messenger arrested. Following the Shah's attempt to remove Mossadegh from power, Mossadegh's supporters began to protest across Iran in support of him. In a panic from the outpouring of support from Mossadegh, the Shah fled Iran for Italy. Mossadegh loyalists in the military arrested many of the coup's plotters, and General Zahedi went into hiding. The U.S. began considering ending their involvement in the coup and supporting Mossadegh, but MI6 regrouped, still determined to overthrow the Prime Minister's government. General Zahedi soon allied himself with fundamentalists opposed to Mossadegh and forged an uneasy alliance between the royalists and fundamentalists of Iran. Using foreign funds, the fundamentalists organized anti-Mossadegh protests. Furthermore, Iranian criminals and gangsters were hired to pose as pro-Mossadegh communist rioters and began rioting across the capital of Tehran. General Zahedi and his remaining military loyalists then appeared to save Tehran from the communist attackers and rallied the common people of Tehran to their cause after successfully convincing many that the communist rioters were allied with Mossadegh. After his house was shelled, Prime Minister Mossadegh surrendered, wishing to avoid further bloodshed by mounting a counterattack. Dr. Mossadegh was arrested, the Shah returned to Iran, General Zahedi became the new Prime Minister, many of Mossadegh's allies were killed or imprisoned, and the control of Iranian oil was returned to the British, with the Americans gaining control of some oil reserves as well. Dr. Mossadegh was put under house arrest for the rest of his life and died in his home in 1967 forever haunted by what occurred in the summer of 1953. The Shah assumed control over Iran and began to violently crack down on political dissent. Within a few years of the coup, the Shah formed a secret police force to ensure no one could ever challenge his power again. Although Iran, increasingly westernized, progressed socially and economically under the Shah's dictatorial rule, a key flaw in the Shah's regime was that many Iranians viewed him as a puppet of the West, and the Shah remained deluded that Iran loved him, when in fact, many hated him. The Shah's popularity only continued to decline going into the 1970s. Finally, in 1979, Iran rebelled once more and successfully toppled the Shah's oppressive government, only to have it replaced with the theocratic government of the Islamic Republic, which managed to be even more oppressive than the Shah ever was. Today's Iran is a ruthless, theocratic dictatorship that regularly murders any who oppose it. The relationship between Iran and the United States was permanently damaged by the 1953 coup, and this seed of mistrust has only grown into hatred between both nations. As we see many Iranians fighting for a new, democratic Iran, in retrospect, the toppling of Mossadegh and the National Front is all the more tragic. But what if Mossadegh was never overthrown? What if, in 1953, democracy was not ended in Iran? What would Iran look like today? Let's find out. Our point of divergence for this timeline is the 1951 British general election. In our timeline, the Labour Party won the plurality of votes, but still narrowly lost to the Conservative Party. However, in our alternate timeline, the Labour Party instead manages to perform slightly better across the UK and Clement Attlee remains Britain's leader going into the 1950s. In this alternate timeline, Clement Attlee remains forceful that Iran must give Britain back their oil concession, and his blockade still strangles the Iranian economy. However, without Winston Churchill pressuring the US to overthrow Mossadegh's government, in this timeline, in August 1953,
President Eisenhower publicly comes out in support of Mossadegh, fearing that his overthrow could empower Iran's communists and risk Iran becoming a Soviet allied state, as well as destroy any chance of friendship between Iran and the U.S. in the future. Reluctantly, under Atlee's less aggressive leadership, in the winter of 1953, Britain, having exhausted all options short of military intervention and lacking U.S. support, ends their boycott of Iranian oil and their blockade of Iran's coastlines. Britain never returns to the oil fields of Iran, having found alternate sources elsewhere in the world. Furthermore, the UK and Iran break off diplomatic relations following Prime Minister Mossadegh's victory in the Abadan crisis. However, other European countries, mainly Italy, soon become involved in the nationalized oil industry of Iran, working the oil fields under Iranian supervision. As the economic malaise of the Abadan crisis ends in a victory for Iran, Prime Minister Mossadegh's popularity skyrockets. Mossadegh calls for a snap election, and this election results in a landslide victory for Mossadegh's popular front party, with Mossadegh's mandate to rule reaffirmed after the difficult years of the Abadan crisis. The Shah of Iran grows anxious as Mossadegh consolidates his power over Iran, and hardliner royalists, led by General Fazlullah Zahedi, urge the Shah to remove Mossadegh from power, lest he supplant the Shah as the biggest figure in the Iranian government. The Shah, convinced that the people would support him removing Mossadegh from power now that the National Front no longer had the oil crisis to rally the people to their cause, follows through on General Zahedi's advice. On December 21st, 1953, the Shah sends a royal decree to the office of Prime Minister Mossadegh, ordering him to immediately vacate the office. Mossadegh is shocked that the Shah's jealousy has gotten to such a point where he would so boldly challenge his rule. After consulting with his cabinet, Mossadegh has the Shah's emissary arrested and issues a call to the people of Iran via radio to fill the nation's streets in support of their democracy. The people, as well as much of the military, heed Mossadegh's call to action. The Shah, in a panic, flees Iran alongside the royal family and General Zahedi and other royalist figures in the military are arrested and court-martialed, spending years in prison. Urged by his protege, Hossein Fatimi, to declare a republic, Mossadegh heeds his advice, and on December 25, 1953, Prime Minister Mossadegh proclaims the birth of the Republic of Iran. After this proclamation, Mossadegh moves quickly to ensure that all sectors of the government and military, as well as a solid majority of the people, support his new republican government. Because of his victory in the Abadan crisis, Mossadegh is able to consolidate enough support to allow him to make this drastic decision. New national elections are held across Iran on January 25, 1954. Mossadegh stands as the National Front's candidate for President of the Republic, and Mossadegh's ally, Hossein Fatimi, becomes Mossadegh's Vice President. The Iranian parliament is completely overhauled and re-established as the Iranian Congress, a unicameral legislative body working in tandem with the executive branch of the president to lead Iran. The United States of America is the first country to send its congratulations to Iran after its peaceful and democratic transition to a true presidential republic. The first order of the Congress is to draft a new constitution for Iran, and because the National Front swept the first election, Mossadegh and the National Front have near complete control over the writing of Iran's new governing document. Taking heavy inspiration from Mossadegh's ideology of progressive democracy, the Iranian constitution of 1954 enshrines into law a guarantee of basic human rights, the right to free education, full equality of the sexes, albeit in a manner where it will be implemented at a slow pace to satisfy the more fundamentalist elements in Iran, and freedom of speech and religion. Lastly, the Republic of Iran is established as a secular presidential republic. President Mossadegh leads Iran for the rest of the 1950s, and as the world around them grows ever more chaotic, Mossadegh's Iran successfully navigates the difficult currents of the Cold War. Iran's embrace of the presidential republican system ensures good relations with the United States going forward. However, Mossadegh is not as pro-Western as the Shah, Mossadegh's progressive reforms are slower than the Shah's were as well, and, as a result, they do not inflame religious tensions the way the Shah did in the years leading up to the Islamic Revolution. With Mossadegh's gentler touch, fundamentalism in Iran slowly and quietly loses its relevance without any martyrs or oppression to keep their movement going.
Mossadegh also tightly controls Iran's oil, determined to never have Iran be subservient to another nation's energy needs again. So, despite its friendly relations with the West, in this alternate timeline, Iran still keeps its distance, not looking for a fight with the communist world or the capitalist one. After serving two successful terms on January 25, 1961, President Mossadegh announces that he will not seek re-election in the 1962 presidential elections, wishing to spend his remaining years with his family as he enters his 80s. Mossadegh's mantle is taken up by his younger protege, Hossein Fatimi, who wins the 1962 presidential election as the candidate of the National Front. Fatimi more or less continues to rule in the same manner Mossadegh did. The 1960s and 70s go on to be a golden age for Iran without any of the political upheaval and tension Iran suffered in our timeline. On February 11, 1979, former President Mossadegh passes away at his home in Tehran, aged 96 years old. His funeral is a massive public affair as the thousands of mourners in attendance disrupt his funeral procession and his coffin is carried by the crowd to its final resting place instead of by the designated pallbearers. Mossadegh's tomb is built to commemorate the man who many Iranians consider to be the greatest Iranian of the modern era and becomes one of the most visited sites in the country by tourists and locals alike. After Mossadegh's passing, 1979 comes and goes just like any other year, and after each election, Iranian faith in democracy only grows stronger. The terms Ayatollah, morality police, and Islamic Republic never enter the Western lexicon. By the 1980s, the women of Iran have gained full rights on par with their male counterparts, and Iran shines as a beacon of stability in the often turbulent lands of West Asia. In the summer of 1980, the last Shah of Iran dies in exile in London, and reluctantly the Republic of Iran allows his body to be returned to Iran and buried there in a small and quiet ceremony. In 1985, Iran and Britain finally re-establish diplomatic relations after three decades of animosity between the two nations, and the last visible scars of the Abadan crisis disappear from the social and political fabric of Iranian society. Going into the 21st century, Iran emerges as the model to be followed for any of its neighbors who aspire to live under democratic rule. On September 16, 2022, a young woman named Masa Amini goes to Tehran to visit her brother. The visit goes as planned, and afterwards, she leaves Tehran without issue. Her name is never known to men and women across the world, nor to the people of Iran. Across the nation, men and women live as equals, and the people prosper under the democracy that Mohammed Mossadegh fought so hard for. When Iran's sovereignty and democracy were threatened, fate intervened to preserve it for the betterment of all.